Assalamualaikum wabarakatuh. The Honorable Professor Rupa Bunsinsuk, a student lecturer and also all participant of the International Soft Course Collaboration Therapy on Neuromusculoskeletal Disorder. It is my pleasure to be your moderator in this session and meet you all in this Zoom meeting. Uh, I am Zidni, behalf of Physiotherapist Department in University of Muhammadiyah Malang. And today's class is our seventh meeting in a series of international short course held by Faculty of Health Science, University of Muhammadiyah Malang, Indonesia. As I mentioned before, Professor Rumpa Bunsin Suk will be today's lecture, and she is the Dean of Faculty of Physical Therapy, Srina Karin Wirot, University, Thailand. And her topic today is Postural Control. So during this class, please mute your uh, microphone, turn on your camera, and give your full attention to Professor Rumpa. And if you have any question, you can write down in the chat box or you can ask directly in a Q&A session after this presentation. And without any further ado, Professor Rumpa, time is yours. Thank you very much. And also uh, thank Dr. Rosati for the invitation. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today and to share my research work uh, with you, um, your colleague and your student at the Faculty of Health Science, um, University of uh, Muhammadiyah Malang. Okay, so I'm going to share the, uh, my PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, can you see my uh, slide? Yes, Professor. Okay. All right. So um, this is the topic of today, partial control. And uh, currently I'm working at the Faculty of Physical Therapy, Sina Green Willow University in Thailand. Um, and uh, we just uh, have the MOU signed between uh, our faculty and your faculty. So hopefully in the future, uh, we can have uh, exchange activities going on. Now, uh, the talk about the partial control today is uh, going to be uh, two parts. Uh, the part one is going to be the lecture, uh, the review about the partial control impairments in stroke. And then I will go into the assessment and the guideline for intervention of the uh, stroke uh, patient who have partial control problem. So uh, when we talk about partial control, um, you probably already know there are two goals of partial control. The first one is partial orientation or we call posture. Posture is the ability to keep the alignment of body with reference uh, reference can be surface, can be gravitational force, and can be visual environment. So when we talk about partial orientation, it is to align uh, the body properly with environment. The other goal of partial control is partial equilibrium or balance. And this is to control the central body mass within the base of support. Normally, these two goals of partial control need to be uh, coexist together. So you can see the uh, ballerina here. Uh, she has both good posture and also she is able to control the central body mass within her very small base of support. Okay. Uh, and this is also the aim of we as a physical therapist try to make sure that our patient has good posture and also has good balance. Now, uh, the control for partial control uh, come from the study with the spinal eye cat. Okay, so they bring the spinal eye cat who has uh, been uh, cut at the spinal cord. Uh, so both high limbs here uh, are paralyzed and bring the spinal eye cat to stand on the first platform that can move forward and backward. Okay, uh, what happened after... Uh, um, moving the cat to stand on the pla uh, first platform is that the cat uh, was able to maintain good posture on the platform. But as soon as the platform moved, the cat fell down. Okay. So from this experiment, uh, it suggests that the spinal like cat can maintain body orientation, which is posture, 
through joint stiffness and spinal reflexes, but they cannot uh, maintain equilibrium during surface displacement, which leads to the hypothesis that there are two different control for postural orientation and postural equilibrium. Orientation uh, can be controlled within the spinal cord using the spinal circuit, whereas the partial equilibrium need more supraspinal control. Now, when we talk about supraspinal control, we think about brainstem, midbrain, and cerebral cortex. Okay. So uh, with the brainstem, it has been known for a long time that brainstem contain the control of writing reaction, equilibrium response, which will trigger the response that come very fast when you have lost your balance, okay? So in the brainstem, they will have the circuit that control equilibrium response. This circuit can be triggered very fast it is not under voluntary control, okay? But uh, recently, what we know is that for controlling of the balance or partial equilibrium, it also requires the participation from the cerebral cortex for uh, make sure that the uh, response that you trigger by the brainstem can happen in a longer period of time. It can happen with uh, appropriate to the environment, to the situation. And also the cerebral cortex also have different role in uh, controlling balance. For example, uh, we know that if our patient has good attention, they will control balance better than when they lost attention. Also with the intention, instruction can modify the way they keep that balance, anticipation, and also prior experience. So this uh, character uh, come from the control of supplementary motor area, secondary somatosensory area, limbic system, and basal ganglia. So right now you can see that with the control of balance, it expand your knowledge from the brainstem control up to the cerebral cortex. Uh, basal ganglia and cerebellum also take a role in helping uh, in the partial equilibrium. For the basal ganglia, it helps to select the appropriate response based on the current context, based on the anticipation, and it uses the indirect pathway in terms of uh, balance control. Now for the cerebellum, uh, cerebellum will adapt response magnitude and coordinate partial response based on practice and experience. Okay. So from this information, uh, we know that there are several areas in the nervous system that contribute to partial control. It involves the brainstem area, it involves uh, many areas in the cerebral cortex, basal ganglia, and then cerebellum. Now, when area of the cortex has some problem, let's say in the patient with stroke, what will happen? Okay, so I will show you next the partial control impairment in stroke, which uh, will go through each system of partial control as described by Chumekuk and Vulakot. So this system consists of musculoskeletal component, internal representation, adaptive mechanism, anticipatory mechanism, sensory strategy, sensory system, and also neuromuscular synergies, okay? So we will look at each system here and see how the stroke affects the partial control. So for the musculoskeletal component, this uh, component involves the muscle strength, range of motion, flexibility, and we all know that our stroke patient has impaired muscle strength, muscle tone, muscle length, range of motion, flexibility, base of support, partial alignment, and also central body mass position. So this result in the posture when they're standing. In quiet standing, they sway more and faster than the healthy control, especially in the frontal plane because they have one side weakness. They put more weight on the non paratic leg. So the posture is not properly uh, aligned uh, to the gravitational force. And they also need more intentional demand for controlling balance. 
Now for the internal representation, uh, this uh, system involves the body scheme or which we call body map and sense of verticality. This is the ability to align the body uh, proportional to the gravitational force. Okay, so stroke patients also have problem with body scheme, which is uh, very evident in uh, patients with stroke who have unilateral neglect. Okay, so unilateral neglect will forget one side of the body, especially on the left side of the body. And also unilateral neglect also have problem with sense of verticality. So look at this uh, experiment. So um, they use the visual information to stimulate the alignment of the body uh, of the person, okay? So uh, they uh, put the line uh, vertical here, okay? And the uh, person in the uh, experiment will stand uh, upright, okay? Aligned to the visual input here. And then uh, the researcher tilt the line uh, side, uh, rightward or uh, leftward without the subject know uh, that uh, the line has already been tilted. Uh, what happened is that uh, the subject also uh, aligned their body uh, to the line that has been tilted. So this uh, result in the uh, tilting of the body to the right or to the left. Okay, so this uh, sense of verticality um, like this uh, is called the visual verticality because it uh, aligns the body to the gravitational force using the visual pathway. Okay, and the problem with visual verticality also found in the uh, stroke with unilateral neglect uh, because they misalign the target toward the non paradigm sign. Okay, so you can see that a uh, person with uh, unilateral neglect when they sit, they probably not sit, uh, sit upright. They will tilt their body 15 degree uh, toward the non paradigm side, which is the right side, okay? There is another type of uh, sense of verticality, which we call body verticality. And this is uh, obtained uh, through the information uh, in the proprioception of the body and also to the vestibular system, okay? And the body verticality can be tested when uh, you are the subject to close their eye and then try to sit upright, okay? If they have problem with uh, body verticality, the body will tilt sideways, okay? So we have, uh, we found this problem in uh, patient with pusher syndrome. Okay, uh, which is uh, shaped 18 degree toward the affected side, which is usually the right side. Okay, so uh, during the sitting position, again, uh, close the eye, they will shift the body toward the right side. Okay, but the visual verticality is normal. The next system is the sensory system and sensory strategy. And this is to uh, see the contribution of different sensory system which uh, contribute to the control of balance. Uh, this is a, a cutaneous system, uh, proprioception, and also the visual system. And you probably familiar with the form and dome test here. Okay, so uh, patient with stroke, you can see that they have problem with um, balance during standing when there is uh, no vision condition and stand on foam or uh, using the dome and stand on foam, okay? So they have uh, decreased uh, their stability when they decrease sensory redundancy. Now, the next uh, system is the adaptive response. Adaptive response is the response that trigger from external perturbation. So when uh, there is outside force to push, against you and you have to try to recover your balance or try to maintain your balance. This is adaptive response, okay? So uh, stroke subject uh, also have problem with adaptive response. So this study show uh, the EMG activity from the medial gastrocnemius between the left side and the non parotic side and right side and parotic side. So you can see that the muscle activation on the non parotic side is overactivate whereas on the parotid side is underactivate. And uh, the activation is not tuned to the direction of the perturbation. It 
activate uh, maximally all the time. Okay. Uh, the other thing with the adaptive response is that uh, the structural delay onset of muscle response, which is the red color here, and uh, that still have the uh, presence of the uh, stretch reflex response, which is uh, not appropriate when you try to recover your balance and you use stretch reflex. Okay. Now, the next system is anticipatory mechanism. And uh, this is the mechanism uh, that used to maintain balance before voluntary movement. And the typical example of anticipatory mechanism is using the standing and rest the arm up. Okay, So the prime mover is the anterior deltoid muscle, uh, was activated later than the hamstring muscle. Okay, Because when you lift your arm up, the central body map will shift forward, and that by itself will trigger the forward movement of the body. So the hamstring muscle have to activate before the anterior deltoid muscle uh, function to maintain upright uh, posture. Okay, So this is the example of the uh, paradigm that usually tests for anticipatory mechanism. Uh, what happened with the stroke patient is that the paradigm hamstring did not activate before voluntary movement. So what we see in the clinic is that when you ask the patient who have problem with anticipatory mechanism, try to lift their arm up, uh, the first response is that they won't lift their arm up, even though the, the arm has enough strength to lift up. The other thing is that they try to lift their arm up slowly, try to not disturb the balance uh, too much so uh, they can maintain balance in standing. So all this uh, information, okay, uh, tell you that uh, with a stroke, uh, it leads to the impairment of our partial control system, and each system has unique clinical manifestation. They have uh, different symptoms. So assessment is very important because it will give you the idea on how to plan the treatment, uh, specific treatment that uh, can help uh, the patient uh, in the specific. Uh, domain of partial control. Now, when we come and look at the uh, clinical tool to assess balance, okay? So this paper show there are many, many tools, uh, many clinical scale that can be used to assess balance. Uh, but balance scale is the gold standard because everyone uses the balance scale and it has been recommended uh, for assessing uh, partial control. And then the Chama Bingo functional reach test, Fukumer, uh, partial assessment scale for stroke or pass, dynamic gate index, multi directional reach test, uh, activity balance, uh, specific confidence. Uh, this uh, information from the uh, clinical scale, uh, as I mentioned before here, it give you uh, the information that the patient has some problem with balance, but it doesn't give you specific detail on which system of partial control that has impaired in patient with stroke. So uh, there is a develop of a balance evaluation system test, or we call the best test. Okay, uh, the person who developed this best test is uh, Professor Fei Horak. Uh, from Oregon Health and Science University. So if uh, you are interested in a partial control area, uh, you will be very familiar with uh, Professor Faye Horak because she done a lot of research on partial control uh, at the beginning with uh, National. Uh, so uh, she developed this clinical tool because she know that at present there is no one clinical tool that can, uh, sorry that can differentiate uh, the impairment of a partial control system. So in the best test, there are six domains uh, that used to assess balance uh, system uh, of um, different type of population. Okay, uh, so we look into the detail. There are six domain of the best test biomechanical constraint assess the musculoskeletal component, 
stability limit word quality, anticipatory partial adjustment, partial response, sensory orientation, and stability in gait. Okay, so uh, in each domain, there are several items that used to assess uh, the partial control system here. And uh, the best test has been tested for its uh, psychometric property, and it come out with excellent uh, reliability, test retest, inter intra-retail reliability, internal consistency, and it show excellent validity with the bird balance scale. And the best test is also uh, a popular uh, clinical scale for um, measure uh, balance in different population uh, with balance impairments, uh, cerebral infarction, Parkinson's disease, peripheral neuropathy, vestibular dysfunction, multiple sclerosis. These are all neurological problem. And later it's expand into the uh, musculoskeletal impairment, uh, patient after uh, knee, uh, post knee arthroplasty or COPD. Okay, so in uh, patient with stroke, uh, our uh, research team has been uh, validate and study the reliability of the best test in people with subacute stroke. And we also look into the responsiveness of the best test in people with subacute stroke. And we uh, found that uh, it is uh, it show excellent uh, correlation or uh, excellent validity with the bird balance scale, uh, with the PASS score, which uh, used to measure uh, partial control in patient with stroke who have uh, low function, uh, and CBNM to measure the um, balance in patient with stroke who have high function. Okay, so uh, it showed excellent validity with the previous uh, clinical scale that measure balance, and we also uh, show that the score, the best test, can be used to classify patients who have high and low function uh, with the cutoff score of forty nine percent. Okay. Um, the score of the best test, the total score uh, can be uh, calculated to 100%. Okay, so the cutoff here is 49%. Okay, uh, and we show that the responsiveness of the best test uh, is very sensitive to change, similar to the BERT. So you're looking at the SRM here, the best test show uh, 1.2 of the SRM, which is uh, in the same level of the book balance scale 1.2. Okay, so it's uh, sensitive to change. Uh, the best test doesn't have fall and ceiling effect, okay, as opposed to the book balance scale, which can have the flaw effect or can have the ceiling effects. And the MCID uh, of the best test in uh, patient with stroke is 10%. Okay, so uh, the best test use. Uh, very simple tool that can be found in the clinical setting, uh, stopwatch, uh, tape measure, marking tape, and also the weight 2.5 kilogram. Um, the line here uh, for uh, verticality assessment, uh, the obstacle uh, during the walking and a step over obstacle, uh, the inclined surface, 10 degree inclined surface, and use the foam for test uh, sensory orientation, and this form is the medium density temper form. Okay. Um, before we use the best test, we uh, have the uh, we want to know uh, about the form that used in the assessment because we want to know that which type of form uh, is uh, is appropriate to be used for the assessment. When I mentioned uh, the appropriate form for assessment is that we want the form that when the patient stand on the form, it can trigger, it can perturb balance. So the uh, patient has to try to maintain balance. It should not be uh, flat, uh, similar to the floor because um, otherwise it is equivalent to standing on floor, okay? So uh, we test different type of foam. Uh, we have a uh, neurocom foam, um, EVA foam, memory foam, sponge foam, and floor. Okay, so, and we measure the acceleration of the body during standing. Uh, you can see that this is the acceleration of the body on the floor, uh, when standing on the floor. Uh, the 
um, movement of the acceleration is not uh, a lot. So it doesn't trigger a lot of partial control uh, when standing on the floor as the control uh, situation. But the neural conform trigger a lot of uh, acceleration here. Okay, so our uh, study uh, suggests that uh, to use for assessment, you want a form that can perturb balance maximally. Uh, we suggest the use of neural conform. Okay, and uh, but for training, uh, you can progress the difficulty of standing on foam. You can progress to uh, from the floor to use the sponge foam and then come to memory foam and then EVA foam afterward. Okay. And uh, what we found is that uh, when we suggest the neural conform in Thailand, uh, not many uh, clinic has uh, neural conform, but they have this type of foam, which is the Eric foam. Okay. So we uh, conduct another study to looking at uh, the Eric foam, whether it can be used uh, for assessment uh, in the same way as the neural conform. Okay. So in this study, we use two of the Eric foam because we want to make sure that it has the same height as the neural conform. And sorry, and our uh, results show that uh, the two of the Eric foam also uh, provide the uh, good accuracy in identifying older adult with fall history. So it can be used uh, interchangeable with the neural conform. Now, uh, for the best test, uh, there is uh, several items of the best test that I think that it is uh, interesting because not many clinical tools uh, has this type of test. So I'm going to show you how to uh, measure some of the uh, clinical characteristics of uh, partial control. Uh, the first one is limit of stability in sitting and sense of verticality. In the best test, uh, it measures the limit of stability and sense of verticality uh, afterward uh, during the same movement. So for measure the limit of stability, they ask the subject to lean to the side as much as possible. And then after that, close their eye and come back to sit upright. And the, uh, the way that you can see that it is upright is to compare with the red line here, okay? So if the body align with the red line here, it means that uh, the patient has a proper or has normal sense of verticality, okay? So I will show you uh, the response from one of our patients. So lean sideways is to test for the limit of stability. You can measure how far they lean to both sides and close their eye and then sit up. Try to see whether she aligns to the red line at her back. Okay. One more time to the right side. Lean. Eye close and sit upright. Okay. So uh, you can see that when she tried to come up upright with eye closed, her body tilt toward that line. Uh, toward the, the left side a little bit, not come upright as compared to the red light here, okay? So this uh, patient in particular, she has problem with sense of verticality, but just a little bit. But when she opened her eyes, she can sit upright, no problem, okay? So this is uh, one of the tests that uh, I think is very interesting and want you to uh, have a look so you can uh, maybe apply it in your uh, clinic, okay? Uh, the other one is uh, to test for ankle strategy or uh, the best test called in-place strategy, okay? Uh, for the in-place strategy or ankle strategy, um, they want to see whether uh, 
the person will show ankle strategy or the response from the ankle only, not from other part of the body when there is a perturbation to the body. Okay, so uh, the way to test this is that the therapist will push again the patient uh, using uh, not uh, just a small amount of force and then let go. And the patient has to maintain balance using the movement at the ankle joint, okay? Okay, I have problem with the, okay. So push again the patient and let go. Push and let go. So you can see that uh, the movement that this patient uh, show you, show the movement at the ankle joint, not at the joint. Okay, so this is the ankle strategy. Okay, so if the patient cannot maintain uh, balance, they probably use other compensatory strategy or use other strategies such as using the hip strategy, bending at the hip, or use a lot of arm movement. Okay, uh, the next one is to test for the stepping strategy. And uh, in this video, I will uh, show the video uh, of Professor Faye Horak that uh, test for the stepping strategy. Okay, so for test for the stepping strategy, uh, they will ask the subject to lean onto your hand and let go of the hand. Okay, and the subject need to take one step to recover from loss of balance. Okay, so that is the test for stepping strategy. Um, now, we'll come to look at our uh, patient withdrawal when we test the, the stepping strategy. Okay, so I, I think that uh, this patient, okay, let, let's go forward a little bit. Okay, so she show how to do the stepping strategy. So she asked the patient to lean onto her hand. Okay, not bending at the hip, okay, because she wants the central body mass to go close to the edge of the base of support. Now you can see that the patient is scared and try not to move the central body mass forward outside the base of support. So uh, she tests in the forward direction and also uh, backward direction. Okay, so she tried to make sure that the patient understand and respond properly. Okay, so uh, you can see that this patient doesn't have the stepping response to the back and she used grasping response instead. Okay, um, in the best test, there is also uh, the time and go test and also time and go with dual task. Um, the dual task uh, is the cognitive dual task that asks the patient to subtract the number by three. And when we use this with the patient with stroke, we have some problem because uh, the patient cannot do number subtraction. So uh, we try to find the cognitive task that uh, this term uh, performance uh, dual task in the same way as the uh, number subtraction. 
So this is uh, our uh, study that uh, looking at the cognitive tasks to be used uh, for people who have uh, subtraction operation difficulties. So in this study, we have people, uh, patient, uh, two groups. Uh, this group can do subtraction tasks and this group cannot do subtraction tasks. Okay, and uh, the, um, the effect of the cognitive task, uh, we want the uh, detrimental effects. So uh, you can see that the tasks that come to the negative point, uh, the larger into the negative, that means uh, is disturbing uh, for the dual task. Okay, so for the uh, people who can do subtraction, the subtraction task, is the one that can involve in the dual task paradigm. Whereas the people who cannot do subtraction tasks, the one that uh, disturb them the most is the phonologic fluency, which is the uh, recalling the name when uh, you give them the specific character. For example, uh, starting the, the word, uh, um, give me the, the name of the uh, province uh, starting with the letter A. Okay, so the patient has to uh, give you the name. So um, our study here showed that uh, if the person cannot do number subtraction, you can use phonologic fluency uh, as a substitute for the number subtraction task. And you can carry on the assessment of the best test. Okay. Now, uh, the best test, as you can see, there are six domains and there are several uh, items uh, to assess, which usually take up about 30 minutes to 45 minutes. Um, in uh, practice, uh, we found that uh, best test for a patient with stroke may be too long. Okay, so we develop a shorter version of the best test, which we call the S best test uh, or stroke best test. So in the S best test, uh, uh, we use the rush analysis to reduce the number of the item, uh, come down to the 13 item from 36 item, uh, 11 tasks from 27 tasks. Um, the score come down to 39 score as opposed to 108 score in the best test or 100%. And it reduced the time, it shortened the time to uh, do the test uh, a lot. Okay, so the SBS test take about 10 minutes to do. And this is the item that uh, present in the SBS test. And we uh, look at the psychometric property of the SBS test and we found that uh, it show uh, excellent uh, intra-rater reliability, inter-rater reliability, and also uh, excellent concurrent validity with the Berg balance scale, no flaw effects, and uh, MCID of six to seven score out of the 39 score. Okay. Uh, we also uh, further use the rash analysis to classify the score to give it the meaning of uh, the score, uh, if the person, uh, if the patient received this type of score, what does it mean in terms of the severity of uh, the balance impairment? So uh, the S-best test uh, can be classified into five uh, categories, um, normal, uh, full score, 39 score, and then mild balance impairment, moderate, uh, severe, and very severe. So uh, the, clinic can, uh, the clinician can use it in the practice and to see uh, whether their intervention can improve uh, the score or change the classification of the patient. And also we give the um, classification for the S-best test as well, uh, for the best test as well. Okay, now uh, why uh, we want the best test? because it gives you the information on which balance system is impaired. So it will, so, uh, it will lead to the uh, specific intervention. So if you have a uh, patient who have problem with uh, sensory orientation, 
you can focus on training this patient to improve uh, the contribution of sensory system in maintaining balance. Okay. Um, the one that I will show you here is uh, the partial response. Okay. Um, partial response um, that you see the ankle strategy, the uh, stepping strategy. Uh, the stepping strategy uh, usually uh, is difficult to train because it's the automatic response and it requires uh, complicated uh, equipment for training. For example, uh, the system that has the waste pool system cable release system or even the sophisticated movable platform uh, or velocity adjusted treadmill, okay? Uh, what we do is that we propose uh, the training of the uh, partial response, uh, protective response, we call it VSR or voluntary induced stepping response, okay? And we test it in person with stroke. Voluntary uh, VSR is uh, performed by uh, asking the patient to lean forward, voluntarily lean by themselves as much as possible until they feel that they are going to lose their balance and then they take a step. Okay, so this is the video lean, take a step. lean and take a step, okay? So it's, it's kind of self-induced uh, stepping, uh, protective stepping response. Okay, um, we compare between a uh, stroke, uh, older person and young person, and we found that a uh, person with stroke when performing VSR, they uh, use uh, multiple step more than uh, old people and uh, young people, they also use uh, grasping response more than uh, other groups. And they have uh, more trial that they lost their balance. And the strategy that they use, uh, they use uh, the trunk uh, bending strategy, bending at the hip as opposed to use the trunk leaning strategy because we want the leaning strategy. Uh, the leaning strategy will move the central body mass outside base of, of support faster than the trunk bending because when you bend the trunk, the hip is still within the base of support. The central body mass doesn't move a lot, okay? So this is the character of the VSR and we use this to train uh, the patient with stroke, uh, in the randomized control trial, compare two group of patient with stroke. The first group using the VSR training, and the other group use the system, uh, complicated system called uh, the unstable uh, system that uh, the person will stand on the force plate that can move in different direction and they have a virtual reality um, incorporated into the training. Okay, uh, this is the immediate effect. Okay, so training for one hour and then we measure the response, the stepping response uh, using the force, uh, using the um, surface perturbation uh, force plate. Okay, so what we found is that uh, we found that uh, the VSR also, training also improved protective stepping in stroke. It increased the affected stepping reduce grasping. It also uh, improved the step width, affected step length, single step uh, of the patient with stroke. Okay, so uh, the VSI is a promising tool for uh, the clinic that doesn't have uh, equipment because this is the cell uh, control training uh, and it is uh, probably uh, very convenient uh, in most of the clinical setting. So uh, for training uh, the VSR, there is a protocol here, which I will show you in the video, okay? Um, the VSR training uh, start with uh, stretching of the calf muscles on both sides, okay? so. Do the warm up by stretching of the calf muscles. 
and then do the weight shifting uh, side by side, weight shifting. And follow by the stepping of each leg. And do the and follow by the VSR training. Okay, so this is a training protocol. Okay. Okay, so uh we still in the process of uh, trying to looking at the long term effects of uh, VSR training because we want to find the uh, uh, training that can improve postural control and in the long term try to uh, reduce uh, fall in uh, different type of population, especially in patient with stroke and in uh, elderly person. Okay, so that's uh, the end of my talk. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Rumpa, for giving such informative and interesting presentation. And now we come to the Q&A session. And uh, to all participants, if you have any question, you can write down in the chat box or you can ask uh, directly. And in our chat box, uh, we already have a question there. This is from Ega from Indonesia. So the question is, in many tests regarding postural control, how do we determine which tests are suitable for examining a case of physiotherapy? Yes, best tests have the con uh, contradiction of in, uh, the implementation. Okay. Uh, well, uh, for the best test, uh, when, when you go through the, the literature about the best test, there is the original best test, which has a full six domain of the best test. Okay. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, show, I'll show you the, the slide one more time to, so you can have idea on the information on the best test. Okay, just a few moments. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, uh, if you look closely at the item of the best test, okay, uh, the item of the best test uh, is not dangerous, okay, it consists of the item that we usually use in our physical therapy setting, for example, uh, functional reach test here, reach forward, reach lateral, sit to stand, rise to toe, stand on one leg, Okay, so this is the item that, that we use when we want to challenge uh, the balance of our patient. But of course, with the limit of you have the bell, you have something for fall prevention. Uh, sensory or orientation test here, foam and dome, usually use it. Okay, uh, gate, time of and go. Okay, so you will see that those tests is the test that most of the tests you are already familiar with the test. Uh, only the partial response that it seemed to be a very, very dangerous test, but because it doesn't use a lot in the setting, but if you know how to do it, uh, for example, for the in-place strategy, you push again the patient, don't push a lot, don't push too hard. You just push a little bit because you want to disturb just a little bit to see, to have some idea of whether they have uh, ankle strategy. You don't try to push the patient to fall down, okay? So uh, in that case, I, I will say that there is no contradiction for assess ba balance using the best test, but of course, you probably have some uh, concern whether the patient is already have vital size stable enough to bring up to do a lot of tests, okay? So um, if the patient is still uh, cannot move around, 
cannot sit up, cannot stand up, you probably don't want to use the best test for them because you want to concentrate on other type, other uh, symptom of the patient rather than focus on balance. Okay, yes. thank you, uh, Professor Umpa. And how is the answer, Angel? Is it clear? I hope it's clear for Ega, uh, Professor Umpa. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Ega yeah. Uh, answer clearly understood. Okay, and the next question is uh, from my friend, Prof. Rumpa, uh, okay. Tegmatu Rosida. She's already graduated from Thailand, uh, and she wants to ask you directly. So, uh, Ms. Tegmatu Rosida, please. Okay, hello. Hi. Hi, so, uh, Sawadika. 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 Oh. Sawadika. 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 Okay. Um, I have question. <laughs> Change to, to English a bit. Okay. Okay. I, I thought question. you were going to ask in Thai. <laughs> no. <laughs> I just know the basic uh, Thai. Okay. The question is, uh, when is the best or the right time to give the balance strategy, strategy exercise for patient with stroke? Or is there any criteria or condition that stroke patients should pass to finally we can give the balance strategy? That's the question. Okay. Uh, if you observe the item in the best test, you will see that most of the item conduct in standing. Okay. So uh, my answer would be that uh, if you want to, um, when we talk about balance, okay, uh, if the person lie down on the, on the bed, you don't need balance, okay? But if they sit up, that is the start of training, of balance training. Sit up, try to maintain balance in sitting. So sitting balance, probably the first step that you can implement balance training for the person uh, with any neurological problem, okay? Make sure that they can sit, they have balanced well in sitting. Uh, they can lean sideways without falling down, okay? So that's the, the first step, okay? And once you want to progress into standing, if they can stand, stand upright, okay, is also the first step of balance training, okay? stand and then move around, turn their head around, lift the arm up, okay? Because those are, are already the balance training, okay? And when they can walk, uh, you increase the complexity of balance training to your patients, okay? So I, I, I will say that uh, if the person uh, start to sit up right, Okay, then the balance training can be implemented right away. But if they still lie down, <laughs> then you don't need balance. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that's, yeah, answer my question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Rumpa, for the great answer. And we finally come to the end of the uh, end part of this class. I would like to thank you so much to Professor Rumpa Bunsim Suk for the remarkable presentation about postural control and to you all the lovely audience. Uh, hopefully this session will excellent our knowledge and please give applause for the speaker and for you all. We also uh, like to inform you that the closing ceremony and final topic of the International Thought Course will be held on Friday, uh, 17 June. So make sure you attend your uh, our last meeting and get your certificate. So thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Have a nice day. Yeah, you too. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.